everyone, can everyone hear me? My voice is decided not to be in this conference. Um, I'm asked one of the authors of this paper. I'm Christine Demoy from University of Dundee, and I'm presenting in place of Sandy Cochran, who couldn't make this conference um, at Fort Lucas. And unfortunately, our president is a uh, key author on this paper. Uh, he's uh, writing up his thesis, and so he, uh, he wasn't coming either. So the work that we're doing is to look at um, the performance of materials under realistic conditions. When you, for high power applications, you need to drive material power, drive single crystal power, what actually happens to the material's performance. Um, so again, uh, you want to use single crystal materials because they have very high peak electric constants. Um, the newer uh, generations of single crystal materials, as Dr. Lee has uh, just said, uh, have improved uh, um, phase changes in temperature, which means that we can drive, uh, op operate the future, newer generations of peak electric materials, of single crystal materials, at higher temperatures than the first generation. Um, we also have a higher coarser field, we can drive them harder, and they have a higher QM, which means they're better for, for power and uh, power applications where you're driving them with a continuous, uh, continuous rate. But any material has losses, and the, new, the second and third generations of single crystal materials also have losses, and the stability of the uh, material performance does depend on this, and particularly on the phase transition from, uh, um, between uh, rhombohedral and tetragonal. There have been a few methods of characterizing materials. Some, most of them have been passive, where you apply either a high electric field at um, an ambient temperature or apply um, a high temperature and maybe some pressure. And you might apply a bit of a high, temper uh, high electric field, but you wouldn't drive it until it was uh, operating at a, at a constant operating temperature. There have been a couple of active characterization systems, uh, but these were just to test the, the change in resonant frequency rather than to measure the material property. So the work that Tatrin has been doing and uh, a few other colleagues at Dundee has been to develop an active characterization system with high resolution imaging spectroscopy that I'll go into in a moment with adaptive temperature, temperature stabilization to get the a single crystal to an operating temperature, keep it at that temperature, adjust the driving frequency um, so that we operate it at resonance and at that same time measure the electric energy. We look at two generations of two electric materials. Here's the system. In the middle, in purple, it is the single crystal plate. For the most part, it's being driven at CW with the power amplifier. We measure the voltage and current periodically. From that, we can get the electrical impedance. And from that, that's the measurement that we really want for the, the material property output. But uh, we also use that to measure the, um, the, the resonant frequency. And we also have a thermal camera to make sure that we're keeping the, the single crystal plate at the right temperature. This is a high resolution impedance spectroscopy. The electrical impedance systems available typically have a, a maximum number of points that you can measure of uh, 800, maybe a little bit more, maybe 1500, but not as many as you want to be able to measure all of these resonances and to be able to get the, get the accurate measurements over a very wide frequency range, but also um, the the accuracy around the resonance to get the material properties of. Um, so we've developed a system where we do sequential measurements with an azimuth impedance analyzer uh, over a whole range of frequencies and do many, many multiple um, frequency sets. The whole system um, we do temperature stabilization with, uh, uh, with a PID controller to make sure that we get the resonance tracking. And there's some equations about resonance tracking I won't go into, but this is the concept of the device. We drive the transistor, get it up to a temperature, we uh, interrupt that, and uh, drive it at, at, at over a short frequency range, 
that the electric wave like uses measure to drive at a higher voltage to keep the temperature up to another uh, frequency range and build up uh, uh, um, a large frequency range so that it the cycle of the system. We adjust that up. We have uh, the extruder push us into the middle, electrode connecting, and uh, on the right, it is the view from the, from the uh, thermal infrared camera. You can see the edge of the plate there that is glowing uh, blue in that case. It can get red hot. These are the impedance measurements. Uh, on the left is the current and voltage of direct output. There are lots of types of it, and my understanding is that that's from the beginning of each of the different frequency sets that we're measuring. But that doesn't affect the output electrical impedance measurement on the right, which is the um, magnitude in phase. Um, I think there might be some more information on that in the paper, or I can leave the question to Dr. Jeffrey. This is the temperature control. On the top, the two top two lines are the, the temperature bounds, um, and the green is the driving voltage. So we want the temperature of the crystal to be between the, the red line at the top bound and the blue line at the bottom bound. The green line, uh, you can see there's a first spike at the beginning. That's to get it up to temperature. And then it stops off. Once it gets to the temperature, it stops, the, um, stops driving it and take an impedance measurement. And then the temperature drops down to the blue curve. And then we take and we drive it again to get it up to temperature. So all these green spikes are the times when we're driving it fairly hard to keep it at the uh, keep it at temperature that we want to see the, um, the the property measurement at. And this five volt line is the voltage that's used for the electrical impedance measurement. Here's an example response. Here's the here's uh, this is the first generation uh, binary single crystal material. Black is at the lowest frequency, and the red impedance curve is at the highest frequency. And you can see that the electrical impedance curve uh, changes significantly between its increase in temperature, and at about 80 degrees, the, the, the resonance the resonance that we want, which is at about uh, 4 megahertz here, uh, doesn't exist anymore, um, or it, it's not a useful resonance anymore. And so that seems to be a transition temperature, around a transition temperature. And from these curves, we can extrapolate all sorts of material properties, and that's the work that Sachin uh, has done is uh, the properties. This graph, you know, this chart, shows that for the different piezoelectric materials, generation one on the right, generation two on the left, with different temperatures, the voltage. The maximum voltage that was required to get it up to the temperature that we wanted to operate at. And the color shading on there indicates the change in the impedance curve. So I just showed you an impedance curve for the, the binary uh, generation one, where at uh, high temperatures, the impedance curve wasn't useful. It wasn't a, a curve that you would actually want for a device. So that's colored in red. The generation three certainly is more stable uh, over a larger range of temperatures by operating temperatures than generation one and generation two. Um, there is a variation in the voltage there, and I think there might be some more discussion. There, there's opportunity for more discussion about what those voltages actually mean. Here's the material property variation for coupling coefficients on the left, top left. Uh, dielectric constant top right, thickness constant bottom right, and piezoelectric constant bottom right. So the generation one certainly drops off quite quickly with temperature, and where the generation two and generation three, uh, red and blue respectively, improve, um, but there does seem to be uh, for generation two a little bit of a drop off in the coupling coefficient, and close to 100. Uh, uh, a driving temperature and operating temperature of 100 degrees. Um, but basically, they're performing as as we expect. The um, the key thing is actually that we can make these measurements. So this is showing the variation between driving at 
room temperature and driving at the highest temperature that you're still able to get uh, some of the properties from the resonance curve. And as we expect, the binary in the third generation one has a worse performance if uh, the coupling coefficient falls off the edge. Um, and generation three does seem to be doing better. Uh, interestingly, the dielectric constant of third generation three seems still quite high. That may be because we're close to uh, phase transition temperature, uh, phase transition combining the high drive with the, with the temperature. Um, the the um, elastic properties don't change all that much. This is also expected. So, just to uh, summarize, um, the, the main point is that we've developed this characterization system so that we can measure these electric properties under realistic conditions, under high drive, continuous uh, CW um, drive of devices with resonance tracking. Um, so we can understand how the performance of devices, how the performance of the material is varying. And then seeing some of that uh, measurement over two generations of single crystal technology. Thank you very much.